Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Welcome, podcast listeners, and happy post-Turkey Day. I'm actually recording this pre-Thanksgiving, but it'll come out post-Thanksgiving. So hopefully you had a great one. We got an excellent show for you today. Our guest is the chief economist and strategist at Gluskin Chef and Associates. Prior to that, was consistently ranked as one of the top institutional investor all-stars while serving as chief North American economist in Merrill Lynch. He's also the author of Breakfast with Dave, a daily distillation of his economic and financial market insights. Welcome to the show, Dave Rosenberg. Great to be on. Where are you dialing in from right now? Are you in Canada? I know you're on the road quite a bit. Are you in the Great White North? I am in the Great White North, and actually it's pretty white outside right now. Had a bout of snow overnight and calling you from downtown Toronto at the moment. Very cool. I haven't been, but it's on my to-do list. I've been to almost every everywhere else in the, the borderlands of, of Canada. Love it. But let's get started. So been a long time follower, a bit of a fanboy for your work for, for many, many years and figured we'd take a step back before we get too detailed. But if we're Elon Musk, Tesla man out in space, looking down the world today and the, the various economies, the global economy, How do things look to you? 10,000 foot view. What's the economic situation look like to you? Well, in two words or less, very late. We are classically late cycle, especially in the United States. From my perspective, that still is what drives the bus globally. And from my perspective, you know, we are somewhere between the bottom of the eighth and top of the ninth inning in baseball parlance. So a very late cycle. And my sense is that looking at the tea leaves is that recessionary pressures are building. I know that people are saying, well, they don't don't see a recession coming. And that's because recessions are like an orderless gas. You don't see them until they're already behind you. It makes perfect sense that looking at the liquidity conditions in the marketplace, where the yield curve is going, all the leading indicators, including housing, which is the quintessential leading indicator, And the fact that the U.S. economy has run out of skilled workers, and it doesn't look to me as though the Fed is stopping anytime soon, and the lagged impact next year from the Fed tightening, both in the balance sheet and interest rates, and the massive fiscal policy stimulus withdrawal we're going to see, if next year is not a recession, what I'll tell you is that it's going to feel like it. You know, it's funny. I was listening to a podcast from you from a few years ago, and you said there's nearly a 0% chance of recession in the next year. And it's interesting to kind of hear the different perspective. And I, we have a chart book. I'm a sucker for chart books. And I believe your firm has graciously allowed us to post one of the show notes. So listeners, go check it out. And you can sign up for a free trial on our podcast page. We had a great chart. It says 14 of the 15 variables suggests we're in the final innings in the U.S. Are there any in particular that you look to that have a little more weight as far as the indicators on the economy? Any that you're particularly fond of? Well, there probably is, and I'll get into it. You know, each one of those 15 indicators, they're weighted equally. And what we did was we looked at the contours of these indicators, and they are capacity indicators, they are market indicators, and broad economic indicators, and we look at them through the contours of historical business cycles and how they're trading and how they're moving along their business cycle lines in relation to the past, benchmarked against where we are in the cycle. So it's an average weighted equally, but if you're taking a look at the 15 variables, 14 are, are screaming late cycles. So it's not as if, well, there's, there's eight and there's six. No, this is actually fairly broadly based. Look, I would say that there's two that stand out the most. And it's very interesting because the St. Louis Fed came to a very similar conclusion based on where we are on the cycle. St. Louis Fed and the San Fran Fed, by the way, they do the best research among the Fed district banks. So I like to look at the yield curve. I know that it has been much maligned, as it is every cycle. We're told late in the cycle not to pay attention to the yield curve by the permables, yet it always seems to work. 
And if I had one tool in the kit on a desert island, and a lot of people wish I was on one, it'd be the shape of the yield curve. It is the not infallible, but the most reliable. And it's not even so much that it has to invert that you get a recession. It's the direction of the yield curve and the flatter it gets, and it's gotten a lot flatter this year. It's flashing at least slower growth in the next year. So as I said, it might not be a classic recession, but it's going to feel like it. There's no get out of jail free card. Things are going to be a lot slower next year than this year. So even if you don't have the recession call, it's going to be very close, I think, to something close to stagnation. So the yield curve is an important one. And I would also say the unemployment rate is also very important. And I know that people say, well, but you know, the unemployment rate is a lagging indicator. And yes, I know that is, it is a leading indicator. But you know, when you get to extremes, like a 3.7% unemployment rate, it's interesting because I gave a speech last night where a woman in the crowd said, but you know, isn't 3.7% good? And I said, well, the last time we had 3.7% was in 1969. And she says, well, that's really good, isn't it? Lowest since 1969. And I was trying to be polite, and I said, yeah, but you do know what happened in the next year, don't you? She says, no. I said, we had a recession in 1970. So the bottom line here is that we have run out. We have run out of skilled workers in the economy. Half of the growth in employment in the United States in the past six months has come from this tiny group of people that don't have anything better than a high school education. And I don't want to sound elitist, I probably will, but I just don't know how many busboys, bill captains, and barmaids the U.S. economy needs. But, I mean, if these people are writing code, then I'm just wondering as to what that's going to mean for productivity growth. It's not a good story. We have run out of workers. The administration's immigration policy that has led to a 6.5% decline. How often does that happen in, in legal immigration at a time when the pool of available labor in the United States is at its lowest level in 12 years, by the way, and depleted 10% in the past year, is creating a supply wall on labor. And there's only two factors of production as an economist. That's only two factors of production, capital and labor. Labor is pretty important, and we've run out of it. And so I would say that the unemployment rate at 3.7 and the yield curve getting very close to being flat as a pancake, which I'm sure it will after the FOMC meeting on December 19th where the Fed pulls the trigger again. Those are the two most important components of those 15. Well, it's interesting. You know, one would think that looking at the state of the economy and you had a great chart where you show the front end of the curve and he says the front end of the curve has had a coronary and it's two-year yields just ramping up. It almost looks like a Bitcoin chart from, from last year, just kind of going straight up. But at what point does this start to have increasing inflation pressures or any any thoughts in general on kind of what's going on there? If, if you see a bigger risk of this? I mean, oil has been taking a dirt nap over the past month or two and just nose diving. But anything on the horizon as far as inflationary pressures? It's a great point. You know, we have a couple of cross currents. I mean, it's hard to decipher really how much of this move in oil, which is moving to an official bear market very quickly, is really demand related. And how much of it is supply related? And then do we get another inflection point on December the 6th if the Russians back the Saudis and they embark on a production cut? And there's no doubt that, you know, beyond oil, look at the the CRB metals index is down more than 10% from the highs and probably telling you something about the state of demand in China, which still consumes at the margin half of the world's basic materials. And you battle that against a strong dollar, which has been disinflationary. But I think that, you know, the balancing act is the tariffs, no doubt, a cost on doing business. Those costs, as you could see in droves in the last Fed base book, more and more companies are passing on those cost increases from tariffs, notwithstanding the deflationary impact of lower commodity prices. So we've got that tug of war on the good side, and the good side is 40% of the consumer price index. What about the other 60% called services? Services are the dominating influence in the consumer spending pie, not goods. And services are much more sensitive towards labor costs. And wage growth is accelerating. This is actually one of the new paradigms, is that for the first time in probably a decade, the proletariat, the working class, realized that they are in a great bargaining position. Everybody thought the Phillips curve was dead, 
Everybody thought that workers were too scared to go to their bosses to ask for a raise. But guess what? It's happening. That's what happens when you start seeing uneducated people getting hired, when you start seeing the survey showing very clearly that the quality of labor is the number one issue among companies, and all of a sudden companies are paying up to keep their existing staff. I think that's great news from a social policy perspective. For Main Street, higher wage growth is wonderful. For businesses, though, it's a margin crimp. And of course, it puts the Fed in a bit of a box because it means they have to stay hawkish longer than they otherwise would have in the face of what we're seeing right now, which is a return to financial asset deflation. But the inflation we will see going forward will be from wages. This is the last part of the puzzle, classic late cycle. And this will be the last part of the cyclical inflation that we're seeing right now. And I think it paints the Fed into a bit of a box, as it usually does late cycle. The the risk for the economy is not that the Fed is going to raise rates too quickly. It's going to be that when it comes time to easing, they're going to be way too slow. That's what happened back in the 2000, 2001. That's what happened back in 2007, 2008. The Fed was too slow to act. And, and, And the inflation pressures will probably reinforce that trend this time around as well. Well, it's interesting because, you know, you talk a little bit in the Breakfast with Dave and in this chart pack about, you know, inflation has actually, you know, showed up a lot in assets with with equities, particularly U.S. equities being one of the best performing assets since, since the global financial crisis. And I love it. You had a magazine cover indicator from The Economist, <laughs> which was at the end of 2017, which which had a cover of the bull market and everything. And so as, you know, the cycle nears its its later stages, you you have a comment about so should your portfolio. So maybe talk a little bit about, you know, some of the implica- implications of where you think we are and how that plays out for investors on a practical side, you know, as far as what they should be thinking about as far as positioning. Okay, so let's first talk about the front cover of The Economist in October of last year which had a picture of a bull, and the title was The Bull Market and Everything, so as you had mentioned. And look, I've been in the business 35 years, and I've been around long enough to know this, that when something makes it to the front cover, you want to sell it. It's already in the price. You want to sell the front page news, and you want to buy the the page B16 story on the way to page A1 but you want to fade the page A1 story. It's no different. The most classic example was the death of equities on the front cover of Business Week, just ahead of what was a 20-year powerful secular bull market in the 80s and the 90s. The death of equities, that's a famous one. You, you can Google that. Google the death of equities Business Week and you'll see what that looked like. Great, great contrary signpost. So that got me thinking a year ago that all the news is priced in. And I remember giving my first speech of the year, second business day of the year at the Royal York Hotel in Toronto, where I had that chart up. And then the very next chart was the bars of every single asset class globally. Everything was up last year. And not just Bitcoin, but I mean, the utility stocks were up 20% last year. The worst performing asset class in 2017 was the Barclays Global Bond Index that generated an equity-like 8% return. And I said at the time, I don't need a disclaimer for this particular chart or what I'm about to say. I'm about to say that we this is a once in 50 year event, what happened last year, 2017. And my forecast is that we will not be drawing this chart again in 2018. And we may never draw this chart again of everything going up simultaneously, even asset classes that move inversely. <laughs> We will not see this again to this extent. And maybe to some extent, 2018 is just classic Bob Farrell rule number one, mean reversion. Maybe it was really last year that was the insanity, and this year is just the year of the mean reversion. But the point that I was making in my presentation, I don't have the slide package in front of me, but just back to first principles. When you take a look at the post-World War II experience and you look at what a traditional bull market looked like, The S&P 500 goes up 17% per year. People say, well, my broker told me the stock market goes up 9% per year. Yeah, yeah. That includes the bear markets. I'm talking about just the bull market condition 
and there's been, say, almost a dozen of them, <laughs> you're up 17% at an average annual rate. This time around, since the 09 lows, the S&P, heading into the peak of this year, was up at, guess what, a 17% average annual rate. And so people would say, well, so what's the big deal? We're up 17% on an average annual basis. That's the average. Why are you bearish? I said, well, because historically, you achieved the 17% per year increase in the S&P 500 with 4% real growth and 8% nominal growth in the economy. And this time around, we had an average stock market performance with real growth averaging 2% and nominal averaging 4 So let's just get this straight. We had an economy, the economic fundamentals, running at half the rate it normally does, but we had a normal stock market. So if I had actually superimposed, if I had actually constrained the stock market rebound this cycle to the traditional relationship that the economy has with the stock market, I had constrained it to the traditional relationship, the S&P 500 would have peaked this cycle at 1800, not at 2940. So the question becomes, you know, that other that excess, that delta of 1,000 points, where did that come from? That came from liquidity. Had nothing to do with the economy. It had to do with the construct of the Fed bribing companies to buy back their stock by keeping rates so abnormally low for so long. So we have a situation where, yes, earnings per share did wonderfully well because the share count went down to an 18-year low this cycle. That was a defining feature. Now, look, I'm not going to say we never would have had a bull market this cycle, of course, but if it was just about the economy and not about excess liquidity, we would have peaked at 1800 The market would have tripled instead of quadrupled. And I'm pretty sure back in March of 2009 at the 666 lows, if I told any listener on this call that I would actually guarantee, guarantee you that you will triple your money this cycle when everybody was hiding under the table screaming uncle, I would have probably had everybody and their mother saying, I'll hit that bid. And so, of course, in the case, because at the extremes we have fear and the extremes we have greed, this stock market went on to get repriced a thousand points above what the underlying economic funnels would have justified. So if you get a drift as to where I think we're going, I think what's happened this year <laughs> is an appetizer for what we're probably going to get next year. And so when I talk about, you know, light cycle investing, because, you know, I say we're heading into the ninth inning, it means that you want to be defensive. You want to be focused on liquidity. You want to have a lot of cash on hand. You want to place more emphasis on the quality of the portfolio. That means heightened emphasis on sensitivity towards cyclicality or GDP sensitivity to keep that minimal. Earnings visibility carries on that much more of an emphasis in this situation. And in your fixed income portfolio, you know, being mindful of your duration. But at the same time, especially if you're in corporate bonds or credit, to being very mindful about refinancing risk, considering that starting next year, we have a four-year tsunami where $3.5 trillion of U.S. corporate bonds get repriced at higher interest rates at a time when 50% of the investment grade market is rated triple B or just one notch below junk. So I call it, in terms of investing, it's more about style, QLDS, quality, liquidity, defensiveness, and selectivity in the sense that in the beginning of a cycle, you could have 60 stocks in your portfolio, abundance of opportunities. Towards the end of the cycle, and I'm not telling anybody don't be in equities. You just have to be smart about it. You have to call the portfolio and get it down to a handful, handful of blue chip liquid names that are your best and most high conviction ideas. And that's how you'll survive over the next several months. There's a lot wrapped in that that I thought was really excellent. Let's pause for a moment to hear from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by EquityZen, a premier platform for secondary transactions and private pre-IPO companies. I know many listeners have bought shares in Amazon, a public multi-billion dollar tech company. How easy was it? Pretty easy, right? Now, what about if you wanted to do the same for a private multi-billion dollar tech company like Uber? Not quite so easy. These kinds of investments are only open to the folks able to spend 20 plus million dollars at a time, and that's if the company happens to be raising a round and the investor has access. Equities in has changed all that. Now, accredited investors can get access to some of the largest tech unicorns while they're still private. 
On the other hand, early employees and shareholders can get the much needed liquidity they desire to spend on a life event, like buying a house or having a kid. And every single deal Equities Inc. closes is a company approved transaction. They pride themselves on having a process that benefits all the key players, investors, shareholders, and the company. For full disclosure, I've been on Equities Inc. since 2015, and I have personally invested through their platform. They work with some of the biggest names in tech, and the platform is streamlined, so they take all of the headache and stress out of what was once an incredibly difficult process. To start investing or selling shares of pre-IPO companies today, visit equitiesin.com forward slash meb and sign up for free. If you sign up for that link, Equities In will cut the minimum on your first investment in half to just $10,000. Again, that's equitiesin.com forward slash meb. And now back to the show. You know, what's interesting is you, you you talk a lot about sentiment and and more the of technical sort of indicators than than most economists you know we follow, which I like by the way. That's a compliment. But it's funny because I you were talking about going back to two thousand nine, and I was referencing a, a recent study that our Betterment friends did, which is the automated digital platform where they asked their I don't know if it was they asked their clients or just did a broad survey, but but asked you know, how much people thought the S&P was up since the lows and two thirds of people said they thought the stock market was actually flat or down, which is astonishing, you know, obviously because it's up a lot, but it's been a sort of a weird bull market to me in the sense that, you know, I, I, we had Howard Marks on the podcast and we were saying, hey, do you, do you think a mania, or, you know, euphoria is required for the bull to end? And it's been sort of weird because you've seen pockets of mania, certainly with cryptocurrencies and, and you know, probably closer to you, a lot of the cannabis companies, you know, but, but it hasn't felt like the 1999 sort of party blow off top. But you did mention in one of your pieces sort of a technical setup of, of a double top. Any thoughts on general sentiment? Has it, has it the conversations you have with CIOs and pension funds and all these institutions, it felt more like a situation where like everyone knows that the stock market and other assets are expensive, but they didn't really do a whole lot about it. Any, any general thoughts on, on the topic of sentiment in general? Well, you know, firstly, for people to say that this wasn't like a wild party, like in 1999, I, I mean, I, I would never say this was like the dot-com bubble. No two cycles are ever the same, although, you know, patterns do emerge. And as Mark Twain taught us, that there is a certain rhythm to these cycles. You know, there was a popular notion that this was the most hated bull market of all time. And of course, this was a view promulgated by the bulls, but was basically just not the case. It's just not true. People looked at the ICI data, the mutual fund data, and made that assessment that people missed out on the rally. You know, there's no way that they missed out on the rally because if they did, you wouldn't have had the boom in, in ETFs. How do you explain, how do you square that circle that people are underexposed to the equity market or that there was no big party going on when you had the ETF industry balloon this cycle in nine years by a factor of 10. You know, how is that possible? When you're actually taking a look at the Fed flow of funds and you look at the household balance sheet and you look at the representation of the household asset base and equities, it's almost at the same level it was in 1999. It's at a second highest level on record. So you really didn't even have to buy a whole lot of equities, just rebalanced off the lows and the equity asset share of total household assets has hardly ever been as high as it is today. The only other time was at the peak back in 99 and 2000. You know, the survey data will bounce around a lot, but households are very exposed to equities. You know, there might be a skew to that distribution. I don't have the data by region in the United States or by income strata or wealth strata, but exposure in general is second highest, you know, that it's ever been. We also, look, when you go through a cycle and you start developing, you know, new acronyms, it doesn't have to be an acronym. It could be even a Nifty 50, you know, back in, in the late 60s, the Nifty 50 stocks. We had, you know, something that cycled called FANG, right? FANG. We had indices that were linked to FANG. We had a situation heading into the third quarter of this year where we had six stocks. So I'm including the FANG M. So Facebook and Apple and Alphabet and Netflix and Google and Microsoft, those six stocks 
accounted for 17% of the S&P 500 market cap back at the highs in September. That's exactly the represent share that the six flashiest growth stocks of the late 90s had going into the peak when NASDAQ rolled over in 2000, otherwise known as MILCOD, Microsoft, Intel, Lucent, Cisco, Oracle, and Dell hit 17% share. And so actually, there might be a few more similarities that meets the eye in terms of what the breadth of the market was looking like. We headed into the peak this year where six stocks that were up roughly 50% accounted for half of the market gains. And we had what I called at the time the S&P 494, which at the peak of the market in September were up 3%. And anybody that follows my mentor, who was Bob Farrell, who famously said in his TED Market Rules to Remember, and I'm talking here specifically about rule number seven, markets are strongest when they are broad and weakest when they narrow to a handful of blue chip names. And I'd say that for most of this year, that made it into my daily practically every single morning. There's a sentiment survey that we reference on Intelligent Investor, which has gone back to the 60s and our friends at Luthold analyzes on a slightly different time horizon, which is average sentiment yearly. And in 2017, actually clocked in as the second highest average sentiment year back to the 60s. And not surprisingly, like the top 10 highest sentiment the average S&P return the next year was like zero and the worst sentiment was like 17%. But it's interesting, you mentioned the the percent of equities ownership, which it's funny, we spend so much time building fancy valuation models here and all sorts of other things. <laughs> that that one simple indicator has like the highest R squared of any indicator we know of future, future 10 year stock returns. And it also totally independent of valuation gives US stocks basically Zippo over the next decade. All right, I wanted to shift a little bit because you, you mentioned a comment that I think is important and I would love to touch on is, you know, a lot of the commentary I've heard in the past from you, you know, is focusing a fair amount on fixed income. And you talked a little bit about corporate bonds and, and the situation going on there. Can you can you expand a little bit on what's going on there? You mentioned a fair amount of the triple B's are, are a pretty big part of the corporate landscape and there's a fair amount coming due. What, what, what are your views on the, on the corporate bond marketplace in general, and where is it going? Well, I would say that actually for our next year, it's a worrisome or bad news story, but a potential good news story. I know that sounds like an economist on the one hand, but on the other hand, but let's just set up the table. I said before that corporate CEOs and CFOs were incentivized this cycle, and the arithmetic was simple to embark on a spree of debt issuance to buy back stock. And we never did. I mean, even the numbers under Donald Trump, the capital spending growth numbers have been no better, no worse than they were under Obama. We've never really had much of a CapEx cycle despite all the debt issuance. So it's not even, you can say, well, this went into capital spending and it's gonna earn some rate of return to more than cover the debt interest costs. I mean, this went to buy back stock. So to the point where the corporate balance sheet in the United States is the weakest it's ever been. We have a situation where the investment grade bond market has ballooned to six trillion, but the triple B component, and I mentioned this earlier, which is one notch away from being downgraded to junk, started the cycle 30% share of investment grade. It's now over 50%. We've never had this condition before. And it's a $3 trillion market. I mean, this is bigger than subprime was a decade ago. So you have half of the investment grade market on the cusp of being downgraded to junk, which would represent really a huge financial market tightening and back on the economy. If you saw a preponderance of these companies get downgraded to junk, if they don't get their act together, because of course, you know, once you get downgraded to junk, Insurance companies and pension funds can't hold your paper and your cost of capital, your debt cost of capital and spreads are going to widen out and it'd be a cascading effect, you know, right through the rest of the financial markets, including equities and back into the economy. This is one of the principal risks going into next year is the number of fallen angels, which is a term we're going to hear a lot more of 
how many of these companies will get downgraded to junk, and then what's the corresponding impact on their cost of credit. Now, the good news story is this, and I find what's very interesting is that only 5% of this triple B debt, notwithstanding the fact, by the way, I should add that the median debt to EBITDA in this triple B space is now 3.4 times, never been that high. Started the cycle at 2.1, 3.4, and yet, and yet only 5% of this triple B debt, which is enormous, I mean, you're talking $3 trillion, only 5%, mind you, are rated, have a negative rating outlook by the three major rating agencies. Now you can sit back and say, well, they're, they're going to ra- the rating agencies again. They always just look after the issuer. Who cares about the investor? Same old credit agencies. But what I'm seeing more and more of, uh, a lot of meetings going on between these triple B companies and the rating agencies. And what I find is going to be a theme for the coming year, and the reason why the rating agencies have been patient is what these companies are telling them. And what they're telling them is that the coming year is going to be a year of three things. One of them is going to be a total lack of bond issuance. You're seeing it already. I mean, there's hardly any bid right now. Liquidity is dried up in the sector. New issue activity in the corporate bond market, where you couldn't have sold this story a year ago, has dried up completely. That'll be a theme for next year. That should actually ultimately be good news for credit. But on top of that, you're going to find that the craze towards dividend payouts, the craze towards stock buybacks is coming to an end. So I think that there's a bit of a mean reversion. I know the folks on the on the call that are still in the equity market and that's their mandate or or maybe they just constantly love the equity market. Those fund flows deliver tremendous returns in the equity market, the cycle. I think that's what's changing. I think that's old paradigm. New paradigm is that for the first time this cycle, companies are going to be more sensitive to the needs of the bondholders than they are to the equity owners. So I think next year is a far less aggressive year for dividend payouts, far less aggressive year for stock buybacks. I think they actually come to an end. And I think it's going to be a very limited year for bond issuance. So you may actually find that even the spreads are widening out right now, and a lot of that is because investors, whether it's in commodities or currencies or fixed time or equities, we are repricing to a slower growth world next year. There's going to be some nice opportunities, I think, in the, in the corporate credit market. But there's no get out of jail free card. Either we're going to have, especially given the ballooning refinancings next year at higher interest rates, which companies are going to have to cover with their cash flows at a time when they've got to pay their people more. Think about what that means for all the competing demands on cash flows next year. I think that's going to come at the expense of the equity market. That's my sense. But there's no get out of, out of jail free card, as I said before. Either we get a tsunami of either defaults, haircuts, fallen angels, and that's going to be deleterious for the corporate bond market, or if they manage to stave it off, and if we go back and we say, aha, the reason why the rating agencies weren't more aggressive was because they had assurances that this is what the companies are going to be doing in the triple B space, and they actually do what I think they're going to do, that will come more at the expense of the stock market next year than the corporate bond market. So interesting anomaly, going to be very important to be positioned around that. But my sense is that if we're going to come up with an underlying theme from what you just asked me on corporate bonds for next year, And I think it's going to have an impact on aggregate demand growth, on the Fed, on pretty well everything. I think next year we will look back as the year of corporate deleveraging. You know, and so you talk a lot, you mentioned pension funds and and the various ilk. And the thing that I consistently scratch my head about, we actually wrote a paper about this years ago, is if you look at investor expectations and pension funds universally assume, I don't know, 8%, I think they're now conservatively moved it down to seven and a half. But even institutions around the world, survey after survey after survey, including individuals, even have higher return expectations. The most recent one I saw was 10% with millennials up around almost 12. How does this play out? You know, so many of these pension funds you talk to, and you, you outline this kind of case for way the world looks, and, and we agree pretty much with, with a lot of the things you've outlined. H- how do these pension funds, one, plan on achieving this 8% rate of return? Is it is it the savior of private equity? Or are they just totally delusional? Well, look, you know, it's like what goes around comes around. We, we were having this conversation 10 years ago, 
And so what happens, of course, is you go through a down cycle like we did, and and then the pension funds end up rebalancing through the bull market. And so, I mean, a lot of pension funds got skated on side big time from what happened over the course of the past nine years. You know, maybe that was, again, one of the Fed's goals. I mean, when you think back to QE2, QE1 was a, QE1 by the Fed, I think even the most ardent libertarian would say, well, we had a market failure in mortgages. We have to do, you know, we, we have to do QE1. Fine. QE2 came out of nowhere. It's interesting, and QE2 came out in 2010. It was like nobody was expecting it. On the day that it was unveiled, the market was flat. And then the very next day, the S&P was up 2% because Bernanke had planted an op-ed in the Washington Post telling people we're doing quantitative easing to juice the stock market to get an equity wealth effect on spending. So it was all about the stock market. So the stock market under Bernanke as much as it was under Greenspan, if not more so, was all about getting the stock market up. That's all it was. So a lot of these pension funds, you know, managed to rebalance and cure a lot of their, shore up their liabilities dramatically by what happened this cycle. So, you know, basically, as I said before, an 8% total return expectation in March of 2009 was totally acceptable when you think that a balanced mix would have easily have done that. To have it today, mind you, at the multiples we have today, notwithstanding the fact that they've compressed some, depending on your time horizon, 8% is going to be extremely difficult for the next several years. Now, look, we'll have to keep an open mind depending on how you're positioned, but we may reach a point where we get those multiples way down again in the next few years, and we can then rebase those return expectations off a more reasonable multiple and cheaper assets. So it's a bit of a moving target, but as it stands right now, it's a low odds bet that you're going to get an 8% total return over the next several years based on where the valuations are right now, whether it's cap rates in real estate, whether it's the level of interest rates across the spectrum or where the valuations are. So right now, that would be a totally unrealistic expectation, but I think we'll probably revisit that. And when we get to the lows in the next 12, 24 months, we'll be able to rebalance back into an environment where those returns will get back to 8%. So it's a bit of a missing target is what I'm saying. And it's intertemporal in the sense that it's it's time sensitive. Interesting. Rob Arnott had a great phrase that he used on our podcast, which was talking about the concept of, of having a valuation mindset when you're doing your asset allocation. And as opportunities arise where things are stretched, he called it the concept of over rebalancing towards valuation, which I think is, is a pretty interesting idea. All right, Dave, we only have time for about two more questions. And so there's so many things I wanted to talk about today. We didn't even get into cryptocurrencies at all. We'll save that for, for episode two. How, how do things look like in Canada? I got a lot of good Canadian friends. I love going skiing in Canada. I just went to the largest cannabis conference in the world, which is overstated as you could probably assume it would be, would probably understate the, the reality of, of what the scene was there. So what's the Canadian economy and opportunity set look like these days? Well, you know, Canada has so much potential and yet we find a way to shoot ourselves in the foot. So I think right now the economy is, is, is meandering. You know, we haven't had the fiscal stimulus here as, you know, folks in the U.S. had, so our economy has lagged behind. And let's keep in mind that, you know, maybe the biggest deal, I mean, I know everybody focuses on, on what's happening in the in wheat production, which maybe adds 20 basis points to growth, you know, on a very near-term basis. It doesn't really spin the dial. And then the next round of opportunities are probably more in the U.S., from an investing standpoint than in Canada. That's my thought process anyway. But it's really this incredible discount between, you know, the the benchmark oil price in Canada, the Western Select, at thirteen, fourteen dollars and, you know, where WTI is. And although, you know, oil prices globally have come off, and we talked about that earlier, you have WTI at fifty three and it's been smoked today. But the Canadian benchmark is trading at about forty dollars lower. And the discount is about triple what it normally is. And that of course has a huge impact on the royalties and on the revenues and on the economy here. It's a it's a dead weight drag. And it's because we have a glut of production here that we can't ship out because we don't have the pipeline capacity just yet. And there's only so much you can do via rail. And so that's a big impediment in Canada right now. And I think it's going to take ultimately tremendous political leadership to finally get the ball rolling if it's not too late. And I suppose the only good news I could say on that score is political is that we're only 11 months away from a, an election in Canada. And if you have a pro-business conservative bent, the good news is that Quebec has gone that direction. Ontario recently went that direction. You know, by the time the Alberta election happens, you know, a year from now, 
over 80% of Canadians will be under, you know, conservative rule. I think that maybe that might be a leading indicator for political change in Ottawa. We'll see. I'm just talking about it strictly from a market, from business perspective. But, you know, Canada's got some big impediments. We have an overinflated housing market that is now deflating. It hasn't been destabilizing so far, but it's certainly a detriment to growth. We have overextended household balance sheets and consumer credit here is slowing down, which is probably a good thing, but that comes at the expense of economic growth. The oil price situation is a deadweight drag on the resource sector in Canada. So, you know, the news isn't altogether that good. But, you know, that's the economist part of me talking. The strategist part of me talking is, well, as bad as the news is in Canada, how much is priced into financial assets? And when I'm taking a look at the forward multiple on the TSX, is down to 13. I mean, Canada is starting to trade like an emerging market. And as bad as things are, we are not the Philippines, Malaysia, or Indonesia. And so we have a 13 multiple. It's only been this cheap. Canada has only been on sale this multiple level 5% of the time in the past. So call this a 1 in 20 event. So there's a lot of bad news priced into our market here. There's tremendous valuation support. You know, the U.S. multiple is closer to 16, just a little below that. And you can count on your hands, historically, the number of times that the Canadian market, for better or for worse, was trading at this sort of a discount relative to the S&P 500. Last time we had a multiple discount this high, close to three points, was all the way back in the middle part of 2004. And to everybody's surprise, the Canadian stock market pulled a rabbit out of the hat and outperformed the U.S. market by 1,000 basis points in the next 12 months. So I would say that it comes down to the front cover effect once again. It works in the opposite direction in Canada right now. The front page news is very negative. It's reflected in very depressed multiples. And I think Canada right now, especially when you consider where the Canadian dollar is at 75, 76 cents, looks like a very attractive turnaround story, I would say, especially for foreign investors. I promise to get you out in good time. I have like nine more questions, so we'll, we'll keep them in the back pocket for, for your return. Where is the best place for people to find you, follow you, want to read more? We'll post, obviously, these links to the show notes at medfavor.com forward slash podcast. But where should people follow you? So you can call me directly on my Toronto line, 416-681-8919, or just feel free to email me as well. It's D Rosenberg, Rosenberg at gluskinchef.com. So I know that's a mouthful, but it's D R O S E N B E R G at G L U S K I N S H E F F dot com. And we'd be happy to strike up a relationship. Anybody wants to get a copy of, I know we'll do a trial of the daily that I've been doing since 1998, be happy to oblige. Very generous, maybe not very wise of you to open that up to <laughs> all of our listeners. But listeners, be thoughtful before you spam Dave with all of your questions and ideas. Dave, thanks so much for taking the time today. Great. All the best to everybody. Thanks for having me on. You guys will have the show notes, all the free trial information, as well as the free download, medfavor.com forward slash podcast. You can subscribe to the show on all the various platforms, iTunes, Overcast, Stitcher, Breaker, my new favorite, as well as leave us a review. We love to read them. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Good investing.